There you are. I've been waiting for you forever, dear. Come here. Give me a hug. Hmm. I've missed you so much. Ever since we started seeing each other, it's become harder and harder to go without seeing your adorable face. I really wish we didn't have to be apart. It gets to the point where I have trouble concentrating on my work because I'm so busy thinking of you. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to worry you. Really, it's only because I haven't been in a relationship for a while. I just need some time to get used to the hoarding instinct I have. Eventually, it'll be much, much more manageable. Although I'll probably always be a bit protective of you. And you'll catch me just staring at you from time to time. Ah, yes. <laughs> kind of like right now. Sorry, sweetie, it's... a bit easy to get lost in your eyes. Anyways, until I get readjusted, I'm just going to have to make sure to get my fill of you whenever I get the chance. Which, in this case, means right now. Mm hmm Come on, I'm hoarding you. Right this very minute. What does that mean? Oh, well, <laughs> will I spoil the surprise? It's happening right now, whether you like it or not. So you might as well just sit back and enjoy the ride. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. I won't force you to do anything, but I figured since you came to meet me anyway, you wouldn't mind. I just want to spend some time with you at my place for a little while, that's all. My instincts simmer down quite a bit when my treasure is safe in my home. So, shall we go? It's not far from here. Hmm. Well, this is my place. It's pretty nice, right? Surprise, surprise, that's thanks to my instincts, too. I keep my cave in tiptoe shape. All the better to keep my treasure safe. Now, if it would be all right, would you mind if I wrapped you up nice and tight in this blanket? It's, it's all right if it sounds uncomfortable, but it would really help. Oh, thank you, sweetie. One second. <laughs> well, don't you look so nice, safe and warm. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Now, while you're wrapped up, I'll go ahead and cook us something to eat. How does chicken soup sound? Lovely. I'll get started. <laughs> Oh, of, of course, dear. What's your question? Ah, <laughs> of course. So you're wondering why my instincts would apply to a person rather than an ordinary treasure. Well, basically a dragon's hoarding instinct isn't attached to any particular object. If it feels important to the dragon, then it will want to hoard it. People usually talk about dragons that hoard gold coins and jewels. But if you think about it, most dragons wouldn't have much use for them. But a few of them use them for dealings with humans, or just even like the way they look. Built up sizable caches. Normally, those are the hordes that most people would be interested in talking about. But there are all sorts of other hordes a dragon could have. Food, magical artifacts, and such. Even land in a few cases. Just so long as it's important. And there's nothing more important to me than you, dear. There's something that's actually unique to dragon-blooded humans. Dragons are really solitary, and they really don't usually get very attached to others, even their mates. The mother raises their hatchlings herself, and it wouldn't have it any other way. But humans live their whole lives surrounded by others. They crave contact with others, and that's what makes it possible for a dragon-blooded to become so devoted to a person. <laughs> the really interesting thing is it doesn't have to be restricted to romantic interests. My mother is, well, <laughs> she was about as cloying as a parent could possibly be. I mean, she loves me very much, but I could just never get a moment's peace. She was always checking in on me every hour of every day, making sure I had everything I could have possibly want. 
It was great when I was a toddler, but you could get to a point where you just want to be able to do things on your own. I'm lucky to have a brother who she needed to divide her attention with. Or I think I would have actually ran away. My dad really helped her pull back. He's half human, half elf. No dragon blood, but he did his best to remind her to give us space. She really did find a good balance, and she was able to pass on what she learned about self-control to me. But come to think of it, I don't really know anything about your family. Do you have any siblings? How was your relationship with your parents? Hmm. Ah, oh, <laughs> that's sweet. Are you close with your extended family, too? Have a favorite cousin? Oh? Are you all right, hon? That's not a touchy subject, is it? Well, it's just you flinched a bit when I mentioned cousins. Do you want to talk about it? Oh, so it has something to do with me, hmm? Well, you better get it off your chest. I'm not terribly fragile, so you don't have to worry about me. Ah, so he read the Sundering of Motiki. Well, that makes sense. That's usually the source of complaints against relationships with half-humans. Have you read it before? Wow, I'm surprised. You're so well-read, I would have assumed that you had. But maybe it's better that you hadn't. It tends to confuse people. Well, it's a collection of interviews from the inhabitants of a remote village called Motiki. It was founded after a group of humans and a group of orcs tried to settle the Motiki Valley at the same time. They were hostile to each other at first, but when winter hit, they had to cooperate to survive. And so they became friendly and merged into one group. There ended up being a lot of orc human families. Things had been going pretty well for a long time, but one day another group of orcs came along. When that group left, so did every orc in the village and nearly all the half-orcs aside from a few really young ones. The man who interviewed the remaining adult inhabitants, all full humans, got the impression that this was evidence that non-humans and half-humans would always maintain allegiance to their other half. The humans were understandably pretty heartbroken, and by reading what they had to say, it really makes it seem like extra-species relationships are bound to for misery and failure. What the author and humans didn't seem to understand, though, is that the cause was cultural, not genetic. And it was something unique to orcs at that one particular moment. You see, the most well-known and beloved stories in orc culture are of Greg the Great. He's a folk hero that they all love to tell tales about. There's even an enormous statue of him deep in the orc homeland. Well, it turns out that the statue was in danger. An old tribe had managed to sneak deep past the orc territory and were setting up a siege on the city containing it. The orcs who came to visit were looking for help, and all the orcs who had been raised on stories of Greg the Great leapt up at the chance, as did the half-orcs who heard the stories from their parents. It was an opportunity to defend the most important cultural icon and to see it with their own eyes. There were actually a lot of humans who went as well. The ones who weren't left were the only ones who hadn't heard much of the stories and couldn't understand why they were so important. So as you can imagine, their opinion of events was a bit different. Here's the worst part. After the book was already published and in circulation, the villagers who had left it returned. So many orcs had come from all over to defend the city that the gnolls surrendered immediately, so there weren't even any casualties. The author returned and got their side of the story and realized what a mistake he'd made, and... He wrote a new book correcting the first, but it never gained as much popularity, so a lot of the people never realized the truth. Oh, for sure, you should definitely tell your cousin about this, but I don't want you to get your hopes up. This book may have been where the idea that humans and half-humans aren't compatible started, but it's probably not the only source now. The problem is, since he read it, he's probably heard of other stories that support the idea. Some might be equally incorrect, but a few might raise legitimate concerns. I know that there are a few dragon-blooded who are terrible at reigning in their hoarding instincts who would make terrible companions. 
Thanks to the ideas he got from the book, he would have latched on to any stories like that and taken them as evidence. He might have otherwise not given them much thought, but how they're in his head and knowing that the book wasn't wrong won't necessarily change his mind. I don't want you to think that he's a lost cause, but chances are his biases are built up slowly, so they need to be taken apart slowly. I'm speaking from experience here. The first person I fell for had unfortunately read the book as well. It went about as well as you would have expected. I kept trying hard to make him understand because I wanted to be with him. But all the arguing and pestering just made him less and less trusting in me and other half-humans. I actually managed to bribe him to let me take him out to dinner, but it was just so awkward. He made up his mind, so we had a hard time opening up. We drifted apart after that, but I ran into him years later. I was pretty surprised when he actually apologized for how he treated me. He'd gone off to become a soldier, and over time he'd run into a lot of other soldiers who were in extra species relationships. Each one made him more and more skeptical of all those things he'd heard before. He eventually dropped his biases altogether thanks to that low and steady exposure. So, basically don't expect him to accept us right away. Actually, I wouldn't assume that he ever will. Sometimes people are just too stubborn to change their mind. But in the end, that doesn't really matter. He doesn't have to believe that we have a future, as long as you and I do. Well, that conversation went in a bit of a direction I wasn't expecting. I guess you got to see my history geek side. But I have to admit, I had a bit of an ulterior motive for bringing up my family. You see... My mother's on her way over right now. <laughs> I'm sorry, sweetie, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to insist. She's come a long way from how she's used to be, but knowing I've been spending so much time with someone she's never met before has been driving her crazy. It's either this, or she'll eventually resort to stalking you. <laughs> I figured you'd prefer this way. Don't worry, she's actually really nice. She's going to love you. I'm sure of it. And once she's satisfied that you'll treat me right, we can have the place to ourselves again. I have some fun ideas of what we can do when she's gone. 